Hello and good day. My name is Teacher JV and today we're going to learn about Chapter 5 of your Anatomy and Physiology and it is all about your integumentary system. And in a nutshell, we are all aware about the essential uh, function of our skin. It's because it's the outermost layer part of our body in which um, it is easy to observe. With that being said, uh, we are sometimes being concerned with the way we look, how our skin actually looks like in person, as well as our other uh, whenever we do our um, our favorite sport or any other physical activities. And with that, we will now go and learn our chapter 5. And this is um, an illustration of the kids going outside um, playing the, the beach under the sun and we all know that you know we can get some um, UV light or sunburns or tan skin whenever we are exposed to the sunlight. Let's now start first with the um, with this one what does your integument mean? It means it is the covering. If you're going to compare this one with your cell it is your cell membrane the outermost part of our uh, cell. Uh, while your skin or the integument, the integumentary system, is the outermost layer or the outermost part of our body. And its components are your skin, your hair, the nails, as well as the glands. So this is just the preview of how our skin looks like. So on the top of uh, on the uppermost part, of course, you can see, uh, especially those people who have, you know, uh, dominant hair uh, in the family, you can see there are a lot of hair that is being ex exposed outside your skin. And the first layer, of course, is your epidermis, your dermis, and your subcutaneous tissue, or sometimes we call it as your hypodermis. And we will learn this one one by one um, in full details as we go on with our lecture. So let's go here. The first one is um, the function of the skin as protection. Of course, um, as I mentioned a while ago, it is the outermost layer or outermost part of our skin. And sometimes it, you know, it serves as a barrier for, you know, uh, for us not to be infected with any kind of microbes or you know infection and of course if we are being exposed to the sunlight it is our protection from too much exposure and of course it is your um it is your um uh, how will i term this one it is the part wherein we can also have your water lost okay um, with that being said, um, reduces our water loss. It means that we are uh, preventing dehydration. Okay, if we are preventing dehydration, it means our the, the cells in our body are um, doing well or you know functioning well. Now, the second part uh, or the second function of our body, uh, the integumentary system, is all about sensation. Uh, at the end parts of your fingers and also in your feet, we have actually what we term as your sensory receptors. And these sensory re receptors can actually detect uh, any surface, any tangible things, if they are hot or cold, as well as if we are being inflicted with pain. Aside from that, we can also sense an, any type of pressure. It's because of our integumentary system. Now, the third part or the third function of our skin is temperature regulation. If we say temperature regulation, the amount of the blood flow actually beneath the skin surface and the activity of sweat glands in the skin will both help regulate the body temperature. So it means our internal uh, state of, you know, of temperature is being maintained. Okay, so there's a... Um, homeostasis it's all because of our skin okay i hope this part is clear so that we can move on to the next one how about the excretion a while ago we've mentioned about your 
water loss uh, so that you know dehydration can be prevented. However, we still need to excrete some of our um, of our body waste through your perspiration. Okay, so perspiration and some of the waste products of the glands that is included in your integumentary system are being removed. Okay, so the next one is your vitamin D production. Okay, with this one in your vitamin D um, production, um, it's actually uh, it's actually already in our body, but we need UV light so that the production of the body will be stimulated. Uh, once we are exposed with sunlight or UV light early in the morning, um, the production of vitamin D is being stimulated. And we all know that your vitamin D is a very good um, component for the calcium homeostasis. So that's it. Uh, we have five um, major functions of your integumentary system. Now let's go deeper with our um, discussion, and we have we have our epider we have our epidermis, and we have our dermis, and your hypo um, hypodermis. Now let's now go with your epidermis. This is the first major skin region in our body. It is the outermost part, as you can see here in this illustration. So this is the skin. And this part here, this is your epidermis. And in terms of epidermis, it's actually composed of your stratified squamous epithelium, in which we already discussed in a video presentation that I posted in your Google Classroom. So please go back there to review um, the stratified squam uh, squamous epithelium. Okay, now as a review again, if we say your epidermis, it is the um, uh, the major skin region of our body which is in the outside part now let's go here so you can see here we also have the term um, your keratinization it is the process in which the new cells with keratin push the old cells to the surface it means like it's like pushing out the old ones so that the new keratin or the keratinized cells will be uh, will be surface on your skin and usually it will take 40 to 56 days for the new cells to reach your surface okay so you can see here in this illustration so these are your keratinized and these are your non keratinized okay now with that, we also need to understand the strata of your epidermis. It's because it has five layers um, of your um, skin. Now, the first one here, as you can see, is your stratum corneum. As you can see here, this is the illustration. So this is the outermost layer of the uh, epidermis. Usually it is 20 to 30 layers of dead squamous cells filled with your keratin okay and this one as you can see it's one of the thickest part of your strata okay it's because this one is 75 percent epidermal thickness okay and on this part on the on the uh, most outer part of your epidermis we can actually have your dandruff if you, uh, i know you're familiar with this one this is a layer flaking off your uh, your scalp Okay, maybe sometimes this is um, due to, you know, sensitivity to some uh, shampoos or any other um, products that you're using for your hair. Now, let's move on to the next one. This is um, Talus. I know you're also familiar with this one, especially if you're working hard or you always use your hands um, through your everyday activities. So these are the form. This will form actually when your stratum uh, corneum has frequent friction okay callus is actually formed it's because of frequent friction now moving on to the next part which is your stratum lucidum as you can see the illustration here the gray one it it's actually thin layer compared to your corne uh, stratum corneum and this one uh, it's just between your corneum and your granulosum nothing special on this part actually so let's move to the next one, which is your granulosum. 
Now, with this one, it accumulates more of your keratin. As you can see here, there are keratin cells on this part and um, the accumulation is more on your stratum granulosum. While your stratum um, espinosum here, as you can see, it's also, um, you know, it's also bigger in terms of percentage compared to the other five. It's actually uh, flat in appearance, as you can see this one. And it accumulates a lipid-filled vesicle. So you can see this one. This is called as your lamellar bodies. Okay. This um, lipid-filled vesicle here, they are termed as your lamellar um, bodies. Okay. Now, how about the last one here? Your stratum basale. From the term itself, base, it means the end part or the uh, deepest part. Okay. So this one, this is the um, deepest part of your epidermis and it's, it's just a single layer and they actually attach to your dermis. So you can see the pink one here, this is already the dermis, the second major part of your skin. So this one actually, uh, your stratum basale connects your epidermis and your dermis. Okay, let's move on here. We are already discussing the second major skin, which is your dermis. As you can see here, there are like um, cleavage lines. You can actually, um, you know, observe this one on your skin. Uh, it's all over our skin, actually. So your dermis, actually, they are dense connective tissues and they contain collagen and fibers. We've discussed um, from the previous um, topic, about your collagen and elastic fiber so i hope you still remember this things they also contain your fibroblast the nerve endings again the nerve endings are very important for sensation it's because it's where we can distinguish hot cold pain and other pressures using our tactile um, sense with the use of our integumentary system see how we actually connect everything um, it's because of your integumentary system. Now, aside from nerve endings, it's also have, it also have your smooth muscle, some glands, blood vessels, and hair follicles. We will discuss hair follicles later on. And as you can see here, if you will look closer, uh, these things that we can see, the, um, the lines, these are what we call your cleavage lines. Now, these cleavage lines, they are area where the skin is resistant to stretching. And due to orientation of collagen fibers as well, this one is very important in scarring. Okay, so you can see here, an incision made parallel to cleavage lines result in less gapping, faster healing, and less scar tissue. That is why some of the surgeons will actually consider this one, and they will not just go and incise the person for operation, but they will uh, line it with our cleavage lines. Okay. Now moving on here to the next part, the layers of your dermis. We have your papillary layer. These are the thin connective tissue layers that contains blood vessels. So it means uh, once this one, uh, once this part of the skin is um, in size or um, injured, uh, there will be blood. Uh, present. It's because it already have your blood vessels. Okay. The next one is your dermal papillae. These are the projections that extend up into your epidermis. They remove the waste and help regulate your body temperature. One of the functions of our, uh, two of the functions of our skin. It's actually on your dermal papillae. They are rich on, are uh, rich on hands and feet, which actually contains your fingerprints and we all know that every individual has unique fingerprints and no uh, two individuals will have the same fingerprint even twins okay they are pattern uh, is genetically determined okay and you will see that one in your dermal papillae well your reticular layer this is the deepest layer of the dermis and it accounts for 80 percent of the total percentage of your dermis. Okay, I hope we are not very fast in terms of 
you know discussing this one and if you have your books with you you can go along with the lecture um the more um ways of learning of reading writing and listening as well as you know uh having um a concrete illustration where you can see your books and you can read the slides the higher the retention of your learning okay now let's move on to the next part a while ago we've talked about your epidermis and it has your five strata layers and we also have your dermis and this time we will be learning about your hypodermis as you can see here in the illustration this is the most deepest part of the skin it actually has fats already okay now this one here your hypodermis of course it is beneath your dermis they are already the foundation of the skin and they already attach the underlying muscle and bone so next to your hypodermis you can already find the muscles as well as the bones in our body okay and it actually contains half of the body's fat in your hypodermis and um, in terms of um, fat composition um, it differs from male to female the female actually has 20 to 23 percent while the male has 13 to 25 percent of body fat okay how about the skin color and uh, variations as you can see here, it is determined by the pigments, okay? Pigments in terms of your melanin, in terms of um, other components. You also have uh, something to do with genetics. If your parents are both white, uh, most likely um, their, dominant, um, their dominant color will pass on you. Uh, and also if you have, uh, you are, um, if you have darker side of the family, most likely you will have darker skin. Blood circulation will also be a factor in terms of the skin color and variations. Uh, later on, I will be um, posting some of the illustrations as well as thickness of your stratum corneum. Now, melanocytes of darker skin people produce more and darker melanin than fair skin people. And all races have the same number of melanocytes. It just maybe uh, it is quite different. It's because of our uh, of our climate and uh, where our country is situ uh, situated. You know, for example, here in the Philippines, where uh, it's a bit humid, most likely we have higher in terms of melanin. Or should I say that um, our chance of having darker skin is higher compared to uh, places wherein they have winter. Now let's go here. Now the skin pigments, uh, we have talked about this one. A while ago it is produced by your melanocytes, the melanin. Melanin is produced by your melanocytes. They ranges from yellow to reddish brown to black color. It depends on how high your melanin is. They are responsible for hair and eye color as well, and it provides protection against your UV light. As you can see here, the amount produced determined by genetics, UV light, and hormones. Freckles are accumulation of melanin. Uh, you can see this one actually from your parents or to older people. It's dominant to them. And albinism is the absence of melanin. As you can see here, it's not just human, who are actually um, encountering or you know experiencing uh, albinism it's also with some animals okay and how does this thing work um, so your melanosome are produced by the Golgi apparatus of your melanocyte and then after all melanosome move into the melanocyte cell processes and then your epithelial cell phagocytize the tips of the melanocyte cell processes. Remember the term that we talked last time about your phagocytosis. The melanosome which were produced inside the melanocyte have been transferred to your epithelial cell and are now inside of them. And that's will how you are going to determine the color of the skin. Other factors will be like this one. Your carotene, this is your yellow-orange pigment found in plants. 
accumulates in your stratum corneum. As you can see, this person here experiencing uh, car uh, carotinemia. And then this one is the normal hand, but this one it looks like yellow to orange um, hand. Your hemoglobin, a while ago, we've, uh, we've uh, mentioned about this one also. They're also the blood-related in terms of the color of the skin. It's because the hemoglobin, the one who is giving um, the red pigmentation of our body, um, from pinkish to red color. And of course, if you have lower um, RBC, it means that uh, maybe you're experiencing some um, kind of, you know, um, impaired tissue perfusion as you can see here um, an example here this one is what we call your peripheral um, cyanosis in which you can see this one to um, to the hands to the feet sometimes it will extend to the ears and the nose sometimes these are quite normal especially to cold places like Baguio City or Tagaytay or to countries wherein they have winter Okay, but please be always aware. Uh, be always, you know, vigilant in terms of observing this one because it's too much. Maybe there's already a problem being encountered by your patients. How about this one? This is tanning and sunburn. Most likely, all of us here already experience um, uh, having uh, sunburns, especially when we are kids. It's because we cannot still understand why and how are we having or experiencing sunburns okay this is the too much exposure of your ultraviolet light which stimulates the melanocytes to increase the production of your melanin and the melanin will actually build up to help protect the skin against too much exposure from the sun and then after that one the sunburn is the skin reacting to your ultra uv light so it this is just like a compensatory mechanism of our body in order for us not to have a you know um, maximum exposure uh, we are we will be experiencing sunburn now the uv light causes elastic fiber to clump and become leathery in which if you're going to you know if you're going to check on the sunburn areas it's like leather and the UV light can alter the DNA in cells, causing them to mutate. And too much exposure to the sunlight can actually bring or can actually cause your skin cancer. Other factors for the skin color and disease, uh, the redness. Uh, we observe to our clients or family members um, if they are experiencing fever, hypertension, inflammation, and some allergies the faces or their body parts will flush red, okay? However, if the patient is actually uh, looking like uh, pale, or we term it as your pallor, uh, maybe they are experiencing anemia or low blood pressure. How about having a yellowish discoloration of the skin? And sometimes it can also affect the eyes. That is what we call your jaundice. So most likely, uh, it's because this is easy to easy to observe. You know, we can uh, you can have a conclusion that maybe this person is experiencing liver disorder. Okay. However, if the person is having um, you know bronzing discoloration, the skin is becoming too much bronze. Maybe this person has kidney disorder. Specifically, we can call it as your Addison's disease. In which you will learn more of this one once you enter your third year level and of course bruising bluish discoloration sometimes it can actually seen as your broken blood vessels okay now let's go here so we already finished with the skin uh, skin parts and some of the functions we will now go with your hair components so a while ago, we already have, um, you know, um, you know, gist of what does your um, skin and other body parts looks like. So we already have, we already are here in your hair, this one or the shaft. This is actually a flexible strand of your keratinized cell. Okay, and the roots, this part here, 
it is below the skin surface this is actually it's already on the scalp area okay so we have your shaft and we have your root we also have here your hair bulb now your hair bulb this part here it is the base of the root this is where the hair is being produced okay please remember where does the hair um, being produced it is actually in your hair bulb okay now the next one which is what we call your hair follicle this part here this one these are the group of cells that surround the root and the bulb okay it gives the hair different shapes as well okay now moving on here how does the hair being produced a while ago we've already mentioned that it is produced in your where in your hair bulb okay so the hair bulb rests on the blood vessel to supply with nutrients as you can see here we have the red and the blue these are your blood vessels in which it is the pathway of the blood as well as the nutrients that nourishes your hair bulb so that the hair will actually grow and foster okay so the more um, nutrients and blood that will flow on these areas it means the longer the hair are okay now let's move on to the next one what are some facts of your hair so testosterone and good nutrition promote hair growth and growth occurs in cycles there are times that our uh, the um, you know the amount of growth of our hair is very active but there are certain times that it's actually as well resting okay now the scalp hair grows for three years and the rest or, and it will rest for one year so uh, maybe you can observe this one to some of your siblings or to some of your classmates or to you as well now the eyelashes uh, it grows actually for 30 days and rests 405 days and we all uh, lose about 90 scalp hair per day so um, maybe some of you are wondering why there are a lot of hair loss um, uh, that you are experiencing um, 90 hair per day is quite normal but if it's too much of course you need to uh, consider consulting your uh, doctor now the male pattern baldness is from the loss of the hair follicle and this is evident to our grandparents to our parents and some of our uncles and this is familial okay now as you can see here are already in your hair muscles and the first one that we're going to talk is all about your erector pili and this is your uh, smooth muscle this actually surrounds each of your hair follicle and this one if it will contract and the hair stands on the end that is we actually feel goosebumps okay maybe if you've uh, experienced something that is scary um, you know you felt something scary and then you will be experiencing uh, goosebumps that is actually because of your erector pili okay moving on how about some of the glands that is related with our integumentary system the first one is your sebaceous gland now the sebaceous gland as you can see here in our um, illustration here it is connected to your hair follicle okay so this is the hair follicle now this is your sebaceous gland now in sebaceous gland we have what we call sebum now the sebum these are the oily uh, substance that lubricates the hair and skin and skin to prevent drying and sometimes too much accumulation of sebum can actually uh, being observed with some of our you know relatives or clients it's because of um you know maybe they're uh very active okay now how about the next part here this is your eccrine sweat gland okay your eccrine sweat gland these are all over the body and can open into your uh your sweat pores okay in here the water and the salt secretions happen okay it is your eccrine sweat glands how about the other one your apocrine 
your apocrine sweat gland, they're actually open into your hair follicle. They are located here, okay? And your apocrine sweat gland is all uh, is just um, present in your armpit and in your genitalia, okay? And they actually produces thick and rich secretions. They become active during the puberty and cause body odor. As you can observe, while you are growing, maybe in your teenage uh, years, you are still teenagers, uh, I think. Um, maybe there's uh, there are changes in terms of your uh, of your body odor. Um, sometimes it it doesn't smell good. It's because of your apocrine sweat gland. Uh, it's because your body is also growing and your apocrine sweat gland is very much active. So this is the time that we become body conscious. And if we become body conscious, it's uh, the time that we also use your deodorant. And with that, uh, the production of uh, sweat and other secretions in your apocrine area, in your genital and in your um, armpit area is being decreased, okay? So let's just have a quick review. In terms of glands, we have your sebaceous gland, which produces your sebum. We also have your eccrine sweat gland and your apocrine sweat gland. Okay, so I, I hope you're still there listening. And we are now going to discuss your nails. And of course, uh, different people will have different uh, shapes and you know color sometimes of the nail. This is the thin plate with layers of dead stratum corneum cells with your hard keratin. Let's discuss them one by one. So you can see here in the nail structure, the nail body, which is this one, the most prominent part of the nail, the, uh, the most visual part of the nail as well. Uh, this one here, it's like on the edge part. That is what we call as your cuticle. The cuticle is the stratum corneum that extends into your nail body and here this part here this is what we call the nail root the nail root is actually covered by the skin and it's not usually um it's not usually being exposed okay how about your lonula your lonula it is actually part of the nail matrix, whitish crescent shape area, and it is located at the base of the nail. Okay. Sometimes there is there are jokes or misconceptions when we are kids, saying that uh, this white color here will grow up, and once it will, it will you know, uh, be here on the end part. Uh, you need to cut it and then put it in your packet. It's because it will become money. So you know these are just you know, part of our. You know stories growing up but this one here the lonula the whitish part it is this one how about your nail matrix your nail matrix this is actually the continuation of your nail root and it gives rise to the most of the nail while your nail bed oh, i think we discussed oh, the other one is the nail body the nail bed this attaches to the nail and is in the distal part of your nail matrix okay now how about this one vitamin d production many of you here thought that vitamin d is actually from the sunlight but actually it's not there's already presence of vitamin d in our body but in order for it to be stimulated we need uv okay we need some sunlight we need some exposure so that the vitamin d in our body will be stimulated and it will be produce and it will be used properly so the uv light causes the skin to produce a precursor molecule of your vitamin d with that the precursor is being carried by the blood to the liver where it is being modified next to kidney where it is modified again to form your active vitamin d and the um, highlighted part here the vitamin d can also be ingested through uh, consumption of fish oils, you know, fortified milk, eggs, and butter. Vitamin D stimulates intestine to absorb calcium and phosphate that is very essential for the bone growth and muscle function. Okay, that is why as kids, we are already practiced to drink milk. It's because it is rich with your vitamin D. And 
As you observe also, some of the newborns are being exposed to sunlight early in the morning so that the production of vitamin D will be stimulated and they will grow faster aside from the milk coming from their moms. Okay, let's move on here. How about becoming a temperature of uh, regulator of temperature? Now, the body temperature temperature should be 98.6 degrees or from the range of 36.5 to 37.5. The rate of the chemical reaction, the metabolism, in which we discuss in your chapter one, the sum up of, you know, um, total chemical reaction that is happening inside our body is altered by the change of your temperature. Sometimes our body needs to be cool and sometimes it needs to be heated. Okay. Now, to cool the body, what is happening here is the blood vessel in the thermos will dilate. Once it is dilate and heat is transferred from the deep in the tissues to skin and the sweat is being produced. That's our body will become cold. Now, to heat the body, the blood vessels constrict to reduce the blood flow to skin and heat is retained. Okay, so we're almost done. We are now going to discuss your aging and the integument. Of course, as we grow older, uh, some of our organs, some of our uh, body parts will start to depreciate as well. Some of the functions will not be uh, normal compared to once we are younger. Okay, and that is true with your integumentary system. It's because you can actually observe to your parents that they are now having some wrinkles, you know, having some warts, having some freckles, in which it's quite normal to older people. Now, the blood flow decreases and the skin becomes thinner due to the decreased amount of collagen. The decreased activity of sebaceous and sweat glands make temperature regulation more difficult. As you can observe, um, our grandparents, if you're going to touch them, they're a bit cold, okay? And they easily feel cold whenever it's already nighttime. It's because they have inactive or less activity in terms of their sebaceous and sweat glands, okay? The loose, um, I mean, the loss of your elastic fiber causes the skin to sag and wrinkle, in which it's very evident to older clients their skin are actually already sagged and it has a lot of wrinkles how about um burns it is of course being associated with our integumentary system now we have your first degree second degree and third degree burn and i hope as early as now you can already distinguish the difference among these three categories of burn so if we say first degree as you can see here in our illustration the damage only is on the epidermis part okay so during this um during this accident or injury you'll feel and experience redness slight swelling and of course there's gonna be pain it actually heals within two to three days uh usually no scar and includes sunburns and exposure to cold okay how about the second degree as you can see here so with this one uh, the damage actually is still in your epidermis and some part of your upper dermis but not totally uh, penetrating your dermis it's just the upper part of your dermis you can also experience here some redness some swelling pain and as you can see here there's already blister okay now this one it usually take you two weeks with some scaring and the last one is the third degree which is your um it already destroys your epidermis and your dermis and the burn areas are cherry red and if it's too much it will turn to black okay and the nerve endings here are being destroyed sometimes they're saying that the third degree burn is the one that you cannot already you know it's that it's the one that is not painful it's because your nerve endings are already destroyed it means that you cannot feel any sensation anymore and the first degree is the um it's the most painful one 
Okay. Uh, and let's go back to your third degree. Usually here, you will need skin graft already if the damage is too much. Okay. Now let's have a quick review by looking at this illustration here. So you can see this one. The first degree is just your epidermis. Second degree, the, it already have your blister. Um, epidermis and the upper part of your dermis. While well, third degree here, so you can see the skin already slapped off. So the affected part is your epidermis, dermis. The um, the nerve endings are already destroyed, and sometimes the need to have skin graft is necessary. Okay. Now, how about this one? Okay, another illustration. So epidermis and dermis. This is the partial thickness and full thickness will be on your um, third degree, okay? It will go through your subcutaneous tissues. Now, how about your skin cancer? Most common cancer that is associated with your integumentary system. This is mainly caused by your ultraviolet light exposure. Um, this is usually uh, very prone to people who have whitish skin. It's because they have lesser amount of melanin. Prevented by limiting sun exposure and of course using sunscreen. Uh, there are a lot of SPF uh, lotion that you can actually buy and apply whenever you go outside. You know, do some of your, um, how will I say this one, uh, vacation when you want to go to the beach. The UVA rays cause the tan and is associated with the malignant melanomas. And the UVB rays causes your sunburns. Okay, there's a difference between your UVA and then your UVB. Sunscreen should block UVA and UVB rays. Okay. Continuation. How about your types of skin cancer? We have your basal cell carcinoma. The cells in your stratum basale is being affected and the cancer removed through surgery. For squamous cell carcinoma, the cells above the stratum basale is being affected. This can actually cause death. While your malignant melanoma arises from your melanocyte in a mole, and this is very rare, but if it's you know manifested early or it's not undetected, it can actually cause death. Okay, and on the last part, as you can see here, um, this is the um, cancer of the skin. The first one you can see there, your basal cell carcinoma. The second one is your squamous cell carcinoma. And the third picture, that is your um, malignant melanoma. So once you actually observe this uh, kind of pigmentations in the skin, you know, you need to consult your doctor. Okay, and that will end our lecture for your integumentary system. Um, please review this on uh, this recorded video again. It's because we will be having quiz and then maybe it will uh, be followed by your unit test. And of course, I will be posting some activities in your Google Classroom and we will be having um, another set of discussion once we go to our face-to-face -face class okay with that thank you very much for listening and have a good day